you can all So, uh, Klaus, do you want to start? No. Yeah, thank you. If, you. if you welcome us here with Shaozhang um, Fang, the co-director of this meeting, so to speak, with me together, uh, it's our uh, fifth uh, uh, joint uh, uh, conference over the years. Um, there was a time where we were meeting in, in, in person. This will uh, come back um, soon. I hope, uh, but well, we have to see. So we are very happy that we can do um, the meetings together between uh, GLO and um, IESR um, is this, this way. I'm particularly happy to uh, welcome uh, today as uh, one of our uh, keynote um, speakers, uh, the keynote speaker of today, Liza. Uh, come on, she's a professor a research fellow at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research, which is uh, placed at the University of Melbourne. Uh, so she holds the chair in Asian, uh, Asian economics and business. She's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of uh, Social Sciences and has received uh, some time ago um, her PhD from Princeton uh, University, a place we all, of course, know very, very well and appreciate. Um, now, she's an empirical microeconomist ex applying experimental and behavioral techniques. And uh, in our current uh, conference context, very important, uh, much of our research focuses on policy evaluation is a focus on social and economic issues. She is particularly interested in the welfare of um, the disadvantaged and marginalized groups and the social economic determinants uh, of health. She works mainly on developing countries, particularly on Indonesia, but she has also done lots of work on China, which is no longer a developing country, I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm just uh, joking a bit. Now, she has published high profile, uh, among others, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, um, a, a paper uh, published in 2020 on crimes against morality, unintended consequences of criminalizing uh, sex work, um, uh, and uh, other work has to do with uh, experimental economics uh, or risk taking and uh, but also she has a paper on behavioral impacts of China's uh, one child uh, policy which was published in science uh, in um, uh, 2013 if i remember that well well uh, lots of uh, things i could talk more but we have no time for this um, we appreciate to have her and he will talk today to us about information intermediaries and international migration. So Liza, please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for coming everyone and thanks very much for the invitation, Klaus and Shui Jung. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about information intermediaries and international migration, which needs a bit of explanation. <laughs> so what um, this paper does is it reports the results of an information intervention where we provide information to potential international migrants in Indonesia who are thinking of going abroad to study, say, not to study, to work in, say, the Middle East or sometimes in um, elsewhere in Asia, say, in Korea or Singapore. And um, so we're providing them about information on the intermediary or the placement agency which links the potential migrant with the employer in the destination country. This is joint work with Sam Bazzi, uh, Simone Shana and Fimon Bittela. So, oh, I can, can't see all of my slides. I've got the Zoom thing across the top. I'll just have to try and remember what's on them. Um, so we're, what we're doing in providing information to potential migrants is we're trying to reduce information frictions or job search frictions. 
Uh, so many aspects of job quality are difficult for prospective workers to observe. Um, this includes working conditions and working hours. Also, it's very hard for prospective migrants or workers to know how well they'll fit with the employer and also how well they'll fit with their co-workers. And it's also difficult to know whether to trust the employer and the likelihood that the employer will honour the, con the job contract. And these frictions are only amplified when employers are overseas or in distant urban centres um, and, the, and there's a large distance between the potential employee and the employer. So intermediaries play an, a central though understudied role in these markets. So there's limited information in the Indonesian context, this is certainly true, and it's true in many similar contexts around the world. There's limited information about intermediary quality, also the quality of the placement agencies. And so it's very difficult for potential migrants to uh, make an informed decision about which placement agency to go with. Uh, so we're going to be looking at how these frictions and the provision of information to overcome these frictions shapes international migration behaviour and the outcomes for international migrants. And the quality of the job match has important welfare consequences. So um, international migration has been shown to reduce poverty um, quite substantially among sending households. Indonesians remitted $11.2 billion in 2018, making Indonesia the 14th largest remittance receiver globally. And many migrants are low-skill women who are particularly vulnerable to abuse in destination countries. And you'll see that the, um, the, um, the probability of um, being abused by the employer is not low in these particular types of jobs. We're talking mainly about domestic workers in these settings. Um, so protecting migrants while supporting opportunities to work abroad is a key policy challenge for many um, developing country countries. Um, developing country governments. So you can see on the right hand side, you can see just some excerpts from um, places where there have been bad outcomes for Indonesian migrant workers um, with um, sometimes resulting in death and severe exploitation. So what do these intermediaries do in this market? Well, the air placement agencies are responsible, responsible for pre-departure training. So they provide training to the prospective migrants. This could be very basic training. It can be as simple as uh, teaching uh, domestic, prospective domestic workers how to use vacuum cleaners, how to use modern uh, washing machines and so forth. Also often it involves a, a bit of um, language training because it's very difficult. The relationship between the employer and the employee is difficult enough. Um, without with you know with a huge language gap um so they try and provide uh, some language training but all, of course it's very rudimentary and it's only um provided over a very short period of time you know maybe 10 days worth or so um and our data confirms um stakeholders views that agency quality quality does matter for migration outcomes so i'll show you that in a second but it basically demonstrates that if you if, if a migrant selects a high quality agency, then they're more likely to have better outcomes in the destination country. And these choices are complicated because markets typically contain a large number of agencies. So it's not as though these women in rural Indonesia are choosing between just a handful of agencies. They're actually choosing between often 60 or so agencies with very little, little limited information as to what to um, base their decisions on. Excuse me. So what we did is we ran a randomised trial with potential female migrant workers in Indonesia. And the questions we're focused on are, does providing migrants with information on placement agency quality affect migration behaviour? Does um, this ultimately improve the migration experiences? And if so, what are the mechani mechanisms behind these impacts? So the paper feeds into three, um, at least three uh, existing literatures. First of all, obviously the international migration literature, where there's little known about the role of labour intermediary, intermediaries outside a very small literature on smuggling. So we're, we're, we're con contributing to this small literature 
And our paper provides a novel reason why, migra my why migration rates may be low despite high marginal returns. The paper also contributes to the literature on search and information frictions in labour markets. Um, so while a growing literature studies of the impact of employer side information, relatively little is known about job seeker side information frictions. So we're looking at the job seeker side and providing information to job seekers and looking at the, how that affects their outcomes. And our paper also broadens the study of impacts on consumer choices by looking um, um, looking at consumer choices in sequential search settings. So we're looking at not just what choices the um, potential employees make, but also the timing of these choices. So I'm going to start by giving you a bit more background on the international migration mar market and how it operates in Indonesia. Then I'm going to talk you very briefly through the theoretical framework. Um, and which highlights the potential effects of the information intervention. And then I'll discuss the experimental design, talk about the empirical approach, um, present the main results and then conclude. So, um, the background. So this is a diagram that seeks to explain how the international migration uh, market works in Indonesia. So most migrants are recruited via sponsors. So these are individuals who normally have a relationship with a placement agency, but these are individuals who actually go out to all the rural villages and recruit potential migrants. And then they bring them into the placement agencies. Where And the um, placement agencies does some they do some recruiting of their own, but they rely heavily on sponsors. They match migrants to jobs. So they have a relationship with an international placement agency. So it might be an agency in Saudi Arabia, for example. And that agency um, serves as a bridge between the placement agency in Indonesia and the employer. So the international placement agency has a relationship with the employers in the destination country. Uh, and they feed those jobs back to the placement agency in Indonesia. So the placement agency in Indonesia recruits, they match the migrant with the job, they provide training, um, and they also coordinate the departure and return of the migrants. The Indonesian government oversees the workings of placement agencies, but they do that at a pretty arm's length um, in a pretty arm's length way. They provide information, a bit of information to potential migrants. They conduct registration um, and they process and issue documents. And they also provide some final pre-departure training in addition to the training that migrants receive by the placement agencies. But in practice, what the government actually plays a pretty limited role with the, um, the migrants really experiencing and learning about the, their options via the sponsors and the placement agencies. So just to give you a sense of the conditions under which a lot of these women work, um, here, what have we got? We've got um, the first, the black bar shows you the, her, the percentage of women who don't have um, don't get a day off, so they work seven days a week. So it's about seventy percent of women in these kind of jobs work seven days a week. About sixty eight percent of them work more than twelve hours a day, um, and then about fourteen percent receive their salary late, so not on time. Um, oh, sorry, no, they receive salary cuts, which means that the employer holds back some of their salary to cover various costs associated with hosting a migrant. So most of these migrant, these generally pretty young women live with the employer because they're domestic servants or workers. And so they live with the employer. Uh, and the employer, you can see 61% of these women have their ID documents, that's their passport and other official documents held by the employer. So they're in a very vulnerable position. They can't just quit and leave the country because they don't have their passport. And you can see that 25%, so this is coming from this, the survey that we conducted um, prior to the in, information interventions. You can see that 25% of women reported that they were verbally abused by the employer and 7% reported that they were physically abused. So 
This figure here shows you the types of intermediaries that the, uh, the workers go with. I just saw that in the chat that somebody said there's a bit of noise on the line. Is it, should I keep going or should we try and address that? How bad is it? The noise is not present at the moment anymore. It comes back uh, from time to time. Okay, so I'll just So at the, moment, at the moment, all is fine. Okay, okay, let me know if there's a problem. At least here with me, yes, okay. So. Okay. Yeah, same so, thing. So... Now, it, now we have it back. <laughs> I can try plugging some headphones in, um, but there's no... Shall I just try that and plug it in and, and see that it solves the problem? Yes. Are these working? No. Not working? No. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes, but also the noise. Uh, we are together. So I'm not sure how to proceed. What I could do Will you tell me if I should just keep going or I could grab my iPad, which will only take a second. Well, we have a few seconds, uh, but otherwise we better bring it to the end if, 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 if it doesn't work. Yes. Okay. I'll just stop the video. Just one second. Well, we can take the time to relax a bit. We have no breaks in the rest of the morning, so we can take a cup of coffee or tea, but don't run away. <laughs> stay, stay here with us. It still happens uh, with all the progress we have in international uh, cooperation through Zoom and others. This is not a Zoom problem here, but it's, uh, this happens uh, from time to time, at least in my experience. Um, not not avoidable fully. So otherwise, um, yeah, I think the noise was uh, from time to time a little bit too 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 loud to uh, to constant right to focus. So that's why it was uh, always useful that she tries. But otherwise, we better get her to do the job. It's it's not too bad. It's tolerable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. difficult. Can you hear me? Hear me oh. now? We can hear you, yes? Yes. Okay. So I'll hear This sounds very good, Eliza. It very does. Good. Okay. okay. Yes, it does. I'm, going to, I'm getting an echo. So let me just turn my volume down. There we go. Uh. Hi, Lisa. Uh, for another account, you need to cut the voice, not just lower the voice. 
to Kat's okay. voice. Yeah. So I've mute. <sighs> yeah. You can only have one line open. Uh, so I. I uh, <laughs> I guess you want to be seen through one line and uh, speak through the other. Is this what yes, what you what do? Uh, I think I need to just turn the. You have to to cut to, to close to fit to, to to shut down uh, to to close the line. Not I mean not closing it completely, but but to uh, put off the noise as a the sound. Yeah, but I so I want to do that on my computer. So I need to, but I might just have to stop sharing for a second. Sorry about this. Okay. Okay. Share screen. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, but with the noise. No. With the noise? Yeah. That's very weird because I'm putting it through my iPad so there's no noise. Um, so I've muted the noisy one and it should just be going through my iPad, which I've never had a problem. Yeah, now it's good. It's good for the moment. Okay. It's good. Maybe you go <laughs> ahead now with it, and okay, we, we take it uh, if that. if it. No, no, it's okay. It just happens. Uh, now it just goes through, and we try to, to to follow you. What 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 is still possible? Okay. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So here we. This is showing you the distribution of placement agencies across. Um, Oh, the number of placement agencies per, per village. So you can see in the medium village, there are 60, uh, 60, uh, 60 placement agencies. So there's a lot of choice for these potential migrants. So what we did is we looked at how much variation do agency fixed effects explain. Uh, and so what we can see from our data is that pre-departure training and preparation is determined to a substantial degree by agency effects. So the quality of the agency that women go with um, to on their migrations affects the amount of pre-departure training they receive and the amount of um, preparation. The quality of life and the, the, um, the quality of the job that they, they end up in is also moderately uh, affected by uh, their choice of, of agency. Whereas what wages are set largely by legislation. So we find no effect or very little effect of placement agent, agency quality on wages. Uh, so that shows that there is, may, choosing a good agency is really important because it's going to affect your, the quality of your experience and, and that can operate through the amount of training and the amount of preparation you receive. Because we did a lot of preliminary uh, investigation and qualitative work prior to uh, running this intervention. And what we found is that women were very ill-informed about the role of placement agencies and they were very fatalistic about that choice. So they didn't, they didn't devote a lot of time to choosing a good agency. And so that's one thing that our interventions try and address. So I think... Oh, I could well, just, I just a quick question. Also, we have no time, but uh, uh, because it's so important, these agencies. So these are private. First, the first question. Second, these are they are not shooting. Not, they are not searching the migrants. The migrants search uh, the agencies. Yes, that's right. They're private, and the and the. Well, I'm not sure if it, which. The, it's kind of they're jointly searching, I guess, in that the sponsors are coming from the agencies and going out to the villages and the women. So the women are in the are actually largely passive with the sponsors coming through. Um, and then they, the women, um, often they don't really search. If they, you know, if a sponsor comes and says, we, we can, you know, offer you a job, prior to the intervention, they were pretty much taking that opportunity. 
But if you don't, if you're not searched, can you just go to the website and find a ranking of the uh, of the no. agencies? That's, no, 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 no. There's very little information. Women can go directly to the agencies, but it's a very small proportion of women who do that. Okay. Yeah. So we set up in the paper. We set up a theoretical model, which I won't go to, into in very much detail, but it's built on McCall 1970, and it's a sequential search framework. So you've got the migrants sitting in the villages, and they're waiting for these agency offers to arrive, and they don't have much of a signal of offer quality. And so, by providing them for, with information on the quality of these agencies, we're allowing them to better predict their experience abroad. And so, you can, it's a, the effect on the migration rate is somewhat ambiguous uh, because you can consider like somebody who's really eager to migrate when she can better differentiate between offers she may spend decide to spend more time searching to get a better offer now that she understands that there are better offers out there there's a range of quality so it might there's more value to the woman once she understands that of making a more careful choice where if you, whereas if you consider a, a choosy migrant then quality disclosure may actually help them find a sufficiently appealing offer uh, more quickly. So, so it's an empirical question as to whether the migration rate increases or decreases as a result of this information intervention. However, we would expect to see a, um, a decline in the use of the lowest quality ungraded agencies. So when we say graded and ungraded agencies, we're talking about agencies that will appear on our report card and we provide information on the quality of those agencies. Ungraded agencies don't appear on the report card. Um, and we also talk about sanctioned and, and unsanctioned or non-sanctioned agencies. It's, sanctioned agencies are those who are on, they're, reg, they're recognised by the government. So they're on the, the list of agencies that the government distributes. Um, and, but there are unsanctioned agencies that just kind of operate <laughs> a bit nefariously um, uh, and we find that those the results of going with an unsanctioned agency are particularly poor. So this change, the provision of information can change women's uh, decision as to when to migrate, um, but it could also, an alternative mechanism would be, it could be beliefs. It could make women more pessimistic or more optimistic. So when they learn more about uh, average migration returns, for example, it could make them think more pessimistically about migration outcomes. And so they might that might put them off migrating, or it could make them more optimistic if they actually had more pessimistic uh, beliefs to start with. So we're going to look at the distribution of women's beliefs too, to see whether um, the intervention resulted in changes in beliefs, which then um, drive the outcomes we see, or whether it is more consistent with the theoretical model that we present in the paper, which is about this sequential search and um, the information changing the motivation for uh, searching for longer or searching for less long. So, um, there are multiple information frictions that our intervention seeks to address. Women actually don't, surprisingly, don't know very much about average outcomes for, migrate, for migrant women, even though they live in villages where there are a lot of women have gone overseas and they hear anecdotes about pain experience. They don't actually, they aren't actually, actually able to tell you much about the average migrants, migrants experience. Um, they, have an, they know about which agencies operate in their village but they have a very hard time differentiating between good and bad agencies. And they often don't understand how agencies can better, can help provide a better migration experience. And so what we're gonna be focusing on in the results I present today are the effect of um, providing information on provider quality, holding um, information on how it's important to make a good choice and also information on the average woman's experience constant and that'll make more sense in a second because we've got three information uh, products the first is an infographic and it just describes migration experiences so the left hand side is an example of uh, this infographic that we distributed to uh, women in each of the treatment arms so we we, we surveyed about 7,000 migrants across 400 villages and we use that information to generate our report cards and generate the infographic. Uh, and what this infographic does is it compares average experience of migrants who use good or what we 
agencies that we rank as being in the top 20% versus bad or bottom 20% agencies. Uh, and it provides information on the returns to migrate, migrating and the returns to picking a good agency. So it basically compares a bad agency in red with a better agency in yellow. And for instance, this is about the length, how much training they receive. So you can see you can get a lot more training if you go with a good agency than if you go with a bad agency. The second information product that we distribute to some in some um, some treatment arms, uh, and I'll talk about the treatment arms in a second, is the report card. And this is the main focus of, of the results. So what we did is we took that information from women who had returned from a migration. We asked them about their experience and which agency they went with. And we construct these rating cards, different for each sub-district. So it only reflects agencies that are relevant to the women in because um, they operate in the local area. Uh, and we, again, it's a rating kind of from a, a red grumpy face to a yellow smiley face up the top. And, and it, it gives scores and, and a ranking for the various agencies. Um, these ratings cover pre-departure preparation, monetary and non-monetary aspects of the experience. And the third information product that we use is um, that we distribute is a comic book which really just it's a story about a woman who migrates and it talks about her experience and how she took quite a bit of time to make sure that she went with a good placement agency and why that was important so that's just kind of it's about the um, why it's important to choose a good agency so our 400 study villages are spread across java indonesia's most um, heavily populated island, largest population, and it um, and we selected villages that have a large number of women migrating for work. And these are our treatment arms. So we have a control group which receives no treatment, and then we have a treatment group that receives the infographic. So each of the three treatment groups receives the infographic. The comic only group receives the infographic and the comic. The report card only receives the infographic and the report card and the um, the third treatment group receives all three so what we're going to be doing because I might skip over this in a few slides time is we're going to be comparing those people who got the comp this the third treatment arm with with those who got the um just wait the third treatment arm yeah but we're going to compare the first treatment arm with the third treatment arm, because that allows us to identify the, the comic. If we're looking just at treatment arms by themselves, um, then we've always got the effect of the infographic and also the effect of the community meetings, because um, we ran, the information was distributed by these community meetings. So people got to take the materials away with them, but we, we ran community meetings in the 400, well, 300 treatment villages and um, about 30,000 people attended these meetings. So it was a large undertaking. So there's a baseline survey conducted in April, June, 2015. Um, we had the 7,000 women who had previously migrated. And then we have our main sample, which is 5,000 women who are interested in migrating. And what we do is we follow those women across time for about three years um, through to the end line survey in May, October, 2019 to look at the impacts. So that involves in-person interviews if the women have returned to the country, but if they're still in the destination country, then we interviewed them over the phone or via an informant, like a family member in Indonesia. And sometimes we contacted them through social media. So what do we find? So I've talked through this really. So what we're, what we're comparing, we, we run these estimations where we have a dummy variable for each treatment arm, which is this regression that you've got here. We control for strata dummies and we cluster the standard errors, errors at the village level. But we're focusing on the effect of the report card conditional on the on receiving the comic, the infographic and the facility meeting. So as to be able to identify the effect of the report card. We do checks for differential attrition and balance. That all looks fine. We have multiple outcomes. So we control for that by using the sharpened Q values. And what do we find? Well, we don't have very much time. So I'm just going to focus on the gray area, 
these results, which in the grey boxes, which is the um, effect of the report guard conditional on receiving the comic and the, um, the, the facilitated meeting. Um, first of all, we're just checking that actually people who were in each of the treatment arms did uh, recognise the materials that were distributed in those treatment arms. And you can see that that's the case because we get the women in the report who received the report card being much more likely to recognise the report card. The women who are in the comic treatment arms are more likely to receive to recognise the comic than um, the participants in the other treatment arms. Everybody recognises the, the infographic and the, the statistically significant effect of being a treatment in a treatment arm of have reporting having attended the meetings. So our main result really is that the report card reduces the migration rate. And you can see that here, that the receiving the report card uh, reduces the migration rate by about five percentage points, which is uh, quite a large effect because the control mean is 37%. Um, percent, so 37% of the potential migrants had migrated by end line. Um, you can see that, uh, that yeah, reduces the migration rate and also reduces the probability of them migrate, of the women migrating with an ungraded provider. So they're more likely to, to migrate with a provider for whom we provided information on the report card. We look at beliefs to see if it's a shift in beliefs, so people becoming more um, pessimistic or optimistic about the returns from migrating. Uh, and we find that this is just a distribution of indices of, of, um, of beliefs about, the, about agencies and about the job that they, um, they end up with. And the distributions sit very much on top of each other and not statistically significantly different from each other. So we don't find evidence that the information changed beliefs, the distribution of beliefs about the returns to migrating and the experience of migrating. But we do find that it slowed the migration uh, rate, which is consistent with the theoretical model of search, that, that now there's a greater value to searching for longer, given that you've got this information about the quality of the agency. Do they choose better agencies? The bottom line is, yes, they do. So they're less likely to choose by 13 percentage points to lose, choose a low quality provider and they are more likely to choose a high quality provider and the average grade of the placement agency that they migrate with is higher. So it's all kind of moving in the way that you'd anticipate from having provided that extra information. This just shows the distribution and shows the distribution switching, moving up towards the um, higher end of the quality distribution. Uh, and then we look at how the, um, whether, so they've chosen, they've, they've slowed down the migration, the migration rate, they've chosen a better quality agency. Does this actually improve their migration experience? So first of all, we look at uh, pre-departure experience. So this is a, an index that looks at the amount of training they, re they receive. It even has things like the quality of food they receive while they're living in the training center. Um, and you can see that um, the quality of the um, experience in terms of the pre-departure preparation has improved as a result of receiving the report card. The job, quality that they end up, um, the quality of the job they end up in. And so that's got things like whether the employer holds their documents, whether they're exploited, uh, uh, various other, other components of job quality. And it's um, the, the quality, job quality index increases as a result of re receiving the report card. There's no effect on pay. And that's put in there as a bit of a check because we don't expect an effect on pay because um, pay is largely, largely legislated by occupation and destination. So there's not much scope for variation of, in wages. There's no impact on occupation and destination. So it's not, the report card is not operating by resulting in more women um, migrating to Asia rather than, rather than the Middle East. The Middle East is generally associated with poorer outcomes for women, but we don't see any shift there across those, country, those countries or regions. And we don't see any shift in the, in the type of uh, occupation or very little shift in the, in, in the occupations. So 
In summary, what we're finding is that by making women choosier, the report card induced women to turn down low quality offers, regardless of whether those um, agencies were on the report card. So they end up choosing better quality agencies, but some of the, but some, but they're not necessarily, not always the agencies that are on the report card. So the report card can improve placement quality, even absent offers from graded agencies. And we do a run through a, a whole series, as you can imagine, of um, robustness tests. And so we, we look to see whether res results are driven by migrant selection, because maybe the report card resulted in different types of migrants, maybe better educated or better workers migrating. And then and so we want to make sure that that's not what's what's driving the result. And it's not, we see very little evidence of um, selection effects. We look to see whether the evidence reduced migration, um, whether the, whether the um, migration reductions lead to substantial losses in household income and assets. And we don't see any significant effects on household income and assets. We don't, we look for um, village-wide effects on the migration market and we don't find anything. We thought we might, but we don't find anything there. It was a relatively light touch intervention with just um, these one-off community meetings and we don't see um, spillover effects. So we, we also collected information on women who weren't targeted to receive the treatment, but who were living in the villages where the treatments were um, were implemented and we don't see any effect on the, these women. So it seems like the effect was largely limited to the women who uh, received the treatment, who went to the meetings. Um, and we also do, do some sensitivity by limiting our sample to women who migrated within six months of the intervention because we have a, a higher direct interview rate and you might be concerned that phone interviews aren't as good quality and so forth. So a lot of robustness tests and don't find very much. What we do at the end of the paper is we work out the implicit willingness to pay for information of the migrants. So by so there's a cost to, re, to delaying migration because you're not receiving the income that you would from migrating in those months that you delay. And so that in, we can use that information and look at, at how much they receive um, in their wages and, and discount it back to the present day to work out the implicit um, willingness to pay for the information. And the figure that pops out when we do that is 197 US dollars or 52% of the monthly net wage for median migrant migrants. So that implies that this is quite a large amount of money that the potential migrants are willing to forego in order to wait and search for a better offer. So it, it it suggests that the provision of that, this type of information by governments, for example, is worthwhile because women are willing to um, pay significantly for it. So to conclude, just slightly over, um, information frictions lead to ha hastier, poorer quality matches when women get provided information on um, placement agency quality, they become choosier, the, the migration rate is reduced, they migrate with better agencies, they're better prepared and they have better experiences abroad. And so the policy implications are that improving information flows in these kind of markets can improve welfare. And so but you provide information, the women end up with a better outcome. Ideally, you would, you would try to minimise the delay that that results because that has a cost in terms of foregone earnings for the women. And so governments could think about providing information, say on um, websites on agency quality and the Inf Indonesian government is thinking about this. We've been, we work quite closely with the, one of the Indonesian ministries while doing this project. However, while providing information on placement agency quality, they could also if they could facilitate access to information on job offers, so increase the rate of that, the flow of information about jobs, then they could offset the um, welfare losses associated with the delay of migration. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. I hope that all was okay from your end. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eliza. So uh, this was a fantastic uh, presentation, uh, even with the small technical issues in between. 
that was very easy to follow and it gives an interesting message. You also stayed pretty much good in time. We are a little bit late, of course, but um, still, if there are pressing one or two questions from the audience, we should perhaps quickly take them if you still have the time. Is there anybody willing to raise a question? Hi, uh, I have a very simple question. So are you worried yeah, about- please. Are you worried about if you have a large scale policy, there is a possibility that uh, when you introduce the good agency to the people, more people goes to that agency and the average quality of, I mean, the service provided is much lower, right? So there's such worry maybe. I guess that, that is a possibility. What we had thought, what we were interested in looking at at the outset, but it turns out that there, there don't seem to be these more general equilibrium effects. We thought that maybe but we would see an improvement in agency quality over time so that, so that you would have people shifting to the better quality agencies. And while, while it may be possible, may, that may make it more difficult for those agencies to, pr to provide such a good quality um, product, you would hope that the other agencies that these workers are moving away from would then think, see, oh, what we we need to lift our game in order to attract workers. So, so you know, it could work in that way. You, know, I mean, in the long term, it should work in that way. Uh, but uh, the intervention wasn't kind of large scale enough to, re and it wasn't sustained over time. This intervention. So, so the the there wasn't really any threat to the agencies in terms of, um, you know. Or if they improve their quality, they weren't mm -hmm. going to be, have seen that re reflected on a on a a, um, a future report card. Whereas if the government got involved with these kind of ratings, then there would certainly would be this in an incentive for the uh, agencies to improve their quality. Thank you. So are there regulations? Are there regulations for these agencies from the government? Um, they are pri private. You said that, but are there regulations? Yeah, there yeah. are. And there is, there's an overhaul, the government is overhauling the system because, because they are very concerned. They actually, there was a moratorium on all migrations to the Middle East for a while because there was such high levels of exploitation. So they're trying to do something about that. So we were working with the Ministry for the Protection of Migrant Workers and they are interested, and I think they may even have launched something, a website where they provide information on um, on the quality of work of, of placement agencies, and prior to that, and it, it all is in flux at the moment. So I'm not quite sure what the the, the situation is right now. But um, prior to that, they did there were regulations in place, and the placement agencies were meant to provide a certain amount of training and meant to do this and meant to that, but it often wasn't enforced. So so there was a you know the agencies could could really um, offer a very low quality pro, um, product and get away with it. But they, but they have register have to register or they should just do this job. No, they, they they well they're meant to register, and most of them do. But there there is a segment of the market that is unregistered. I understand. Yeah. Now, is this kind of a model, if you, if you look from the European uh, perspective and African uh, Europe migration, the problem is information and um, one issue and, of course, uh, legal, uh, to, to offer legal, organized legal, monitor legal migration uh, to avoid um, illegal um, uh, migration with no information, so to speak. Uh, would, would, would you think this is, uh, this is something we should uh, in Europe look into? into sorry, sorry, I just missed a bit of that. So, so what we say in, in relation to Europe, Africa, providing, providing this kind of information? Well, in, in Europe, we are, we are trying to avoid illegal migration, yes, but we don't offer yes. legal migration. And uh, because people fear the problems of legal migration, but with the help of of, uh, of monitored or regulated um, uh, agencies, one might provide a market which which brings better output for everybody. Yeah. For the outcomes, yes. Uh, at the end. Yeah. So, so some some of so when Indonesian women, if they migrate with an unsanctioned, so that's a, a an agency that's not registered with the government. 
that is that is illegal actually to do that in Indonesia. And so what what our information information intervention did is it it reduced the extent of that illegal migration by providing this information that it's important to go with a reputable agency. So these kind of interventions could have scope for reducing illegal migration. Oh, okay, okay, thank you very much. I think we have uh, now I have to move on, unfortunately. We could talk for quite a while. Uh, we appreciate it, uh, your willingness to, to, to join us. I know we, 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 have many, we have many other restrictions at the moment, so uh, I'm happy to, to, to that we had, had you here as, at the beginning of the conference. Thank you so much. So let us uh, move on then without further notice. And since uh, Kai Jin is already, uh, so to speak, uh, active, uh, please Go ahead and speak about uh, your paper, which is uh, named uh, Do Social Movement Change uh, Empathy Bias Evidence from Black Lives Matter? So please okay. go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you for having me here, first of all. So I'm Kai Xing. I'll be working for IESR this September. And I graduate from University of Rochester. Uh, this work to the Black Lives Matter protest, break empathy bias is a joint work with two other Rochester students, Jiwei and Nandi. And Junda is our technical support as well as a data provider. Uh, so let me go straight to the motivation of this paper. So our motivation comes from observing that the systemic disparity between African-American people and others existed in all aspects of the United States, education, house, uh, housing, uh, labor market, poor, you can imagine that. And uh, to fix this big problem, the federal government and the state's government have taken a lot of affirmative policies and other equal opportunity policies to, uh, to fix it. But however, the uh, disparity still uh, exists today and people are worried about, okay, these policies have very mixed effect. And secondly, the temporary policy sometimes won't generate long-term effect. So let's think about uh, what is missing from the, uh, uh, from the picture, from the policy toolbox, but potentially might be very important. So, so the sum instrument that can directly change the public's racial preferences, including their prejudice, norms, tastes, emphases, uh, et cetera, and many researchers today have established that these are very important source of uh, the, uh, the, the reason behind why the disparity are still very persistent today. And indeed, the politicians today are looking at those toolbox, for example, as spoken by the Linda Sams Greenfield at the United Nations General Assembly Community Meeting in 2021. So she said, um, so the prevalence and the perseverance of the racial discrimination might make the situation look very hopeless, but we remain hopeful. And these all things shed light on the future possibilities of creating the policies to directly target on the racial preferences. So for example, the executive order 13985 is a good example. And so as for the second motivation, uh, it comes from thinking about how the social movement reshaped the society. And a social movement is an organized effort by a group of people to achieve certain goal. And we social uh, scientists and economics have well studied their impacts on a, a wide range of outcomes. But a underexplored question is how do they change the public's beliefs, norms, and individual practices? And uh, this is very important because all these three elements are the fabric, uh, are the building fabric of the society. Therefore, it is important to study how the social movement affect those three things in order to understand the impact of social movement on reshaping the society from all the other perspectives. So therefore our paper, the general question we seek to answer comes from linking those two motivations and and which is how do this racial justice movement for the African-American people reduce the biased racial prejudice and, uh, and inequality experienced by them? So, so more specifically, the central argument of this paper is that 
the Black Lives Matter movement in the 2020 did change the public's empathy bias towards African American people and generating more donation to those who need the medical support. So we're going to establish this argument uh, using a very novel and rare data, which is a complete and high frequent data set on the medical crowdfunding report from GoFundMe.com. And uh, I'm going to build this uh, paper in three parts. So first, we're going to show that uh, the Black Lives Matter indeed causally uh, decreases the fundraising gap between uh, Black people and non-Black people. And this will be the main focus of today's talk. And then uh, we're going to show that this, we're going to provide suggestive evidence showing that this reduction in the fundraising gap re likely reflects the reduced empathy bias towards the African-American people. And lastly, we show that there is a persistent long run impact. So uh, there are many contributions of this paper, but due to time limitation, uh, I will quickly sh uh, uh, show you the, uh, introduce you the key contribution of our project. So it is a pioneer work uh, from my perspective to show how the social movement causally affect the social norms. So I'm going to break down the contribution here into two aspects. So first, in the first aspect, the previously, uh, in terms of topic itself, the previous literature mainly focused on the political outcomes of the social movement, while the cultural outcomes of social movement, especially how they change the people's empathy bias, is much less explored. And in the second perspective, it is generally extremely hard to establish the causal link between the social movement and the associated outcomes. And it has been uh, stated in these two important uh, chapter books that uh, causality is one of the three major problems that this field of study is going to tackle in the future. And uh, more, and indeed economics are putting their, uh, their intelligence of the causality to study the, uh, the effects and uh, more related to us is uh, our two papers on the BLM. So the Campbell 2021, they studies how, um, uh, how the BRM reduces the police use of violence, illegal violence, and the Algorithm 2021 studies how Black Lives Matter induce more teachers from public school to request anti-racism books, textbooks uh, for the children. And uh, so we're going to show that these previous papers actually failed to establish causality uh, especially for the Black Lives Matter, because they, the strategy adopt, they cannot distinguish themselves from the other things, especially the COVID reopen policy. Uh, the, the key reason is they don't have high frequent level data like us. So that will be our contributions to the whole literature. Uh, so let me uh, refresh your memories on uh, what happened in 2020, the Black Lives Matter. It is, it is the largest social justice movement ever in human history. And uh, so what happened is that George Floyd was unfortunately killed by a Minneapolis police officer in the May 20, uh, 25th of 2020. And this thing makes the public extremely angry and ignited the protests all over the United States seeking uh, justice for the Floyd and the wider Black Lives Matter. So uh, from the May 30th to the August 22, there were more than 7,000 uh, demonstrations and all over the uh, place of the United States. And the data that provides us uh, the each uh, records of the protest, its type, its timing is the crowd counting consortium. So now let me introduce you uh, the outcome variable we're looking at. So it is comes from the data on the, it is a medical crowdfunding records from GoFundMe.com. And GoFundMe.com is the biggest and widely used crowdfunding platform in the United States. And we have a data which is a complete set of the administrative records of the medical crowdfunding from January 1st, 2012, uh, the 2019 to the July 31, 2021. And we have about uh, over 300,000 uh, fundraising projects. So um, a single crowdfunding project will contain the following information. Uh, so first we can know how much money, the, the goal set up by the fundraisers and the beneficiaries we have the raised money at the end, 
uh, how many people participated in the donation in, in the project and the launch date of the project. And we have the pictures, uh, the, the descriptions and the location of the fundraisers. And more importantly, the key novelty is that we have the cash flow records, uh, which is the uh, which is uh, the donation that we uh, the information on the donation, especially the date, the volume, uh, the name of the donors for each donation. So here in this picture, I'm showing you a very example. So my name is Lois. I'm in need of help from the people because I got a ski injury. And uh, I described my cases on the left hand side and post my pictures. And I also have the, my self portrait, which shows my, reviews my race information. And on the right hand side, I'm going to set up a, 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 a 100,000 goal, uh, hoping for the, for the collection of the donations. And also I can see the number of donors and more particularly we can see each individual donating. For example, here, James Ty donated uh, $3,000 and David donated $100. So, um, so with all these nice data, uh, so let me first introduce you a, a very novel uh, descriptive uh, uh, analysis, a uh, descriptive result. Here in this graph, I'm plotting you the log of the raised funds as a non-parametric function of time for the black uh, beneficiaries and other beneficiaries while controlling for the log of the goal, project description, state fixed effect, and time fixed effect. So as you can see, uh, the black beneficiary indeed have received uh, a very significant lower of raised fund at the end than the, uh, than the other beneficiaries. So the gap is around 20% uh, prior to the February 2020, but these gaps start to decline in February 2020 and reaches the minimum level just at the time when the Black Lives Matter hit into the uh, 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 hit in here, and we still afterwards we still see a very persistent uh, uh, reduce the gap. So here XX is the project launch time. So it is, so the conclusion here is that the fundraising gap indeed decreased approximately after George Floyd event, but we're not so super sure about whether protests indeed drives that. Uh, from the graph, it may be true that uh, the, 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 the project uh, launching at February uh, 2020 starts to receive uh, like a treatment at the very end. So, the, so there's a fading area from the February to the May, and afterwards, all the project gets the, gets the treatment. And uh, we're not so sure, uh, and all the other literature uh, due to this problem, they are not so sure. Uh, so, and, and we also established that this is due to the change in the number of donors rather than the change in the volume of donations. So we're going to tackle these causal uh, questions in this uh, next uh, uh, parts. So the, uh, the, uh, let me re-illustrate what our identification uh, challenge is. So it's simply that many other things could happen at the same time. So from the donation supply side, it could be that uh, other events are happening that will affect the fundraising for the black people uh, relative to the white, white people. For example, the COVID-19, uh, the COVID shutdown policy itself, reopen policies, busy cycles. Uh, so, uh, so the the COVID uh, the COVID starts to like at, uh, go into the peak at exactly February of 2020, and shutdown policy happens around uh, March. Reopen policy happens around uh, May. Uh, so all these things are hard to distinguish, and many other unobserved things. So second, from the demand side, the projects are changing. So people, black people may, when they see the black left matters, they may asking for more money. So our essential identification strategy comes from uh, using the panel data. We have the cash flow donation data to, to calculate the daily level number of donors per project. So we find that for the black people, this measure day-to-day -day experience a sharp 90% increase within a week after the George of, uh, death of George Floyd and coinciding exactly with the peak of the protest. So here is the picture. 
So I'm showing you on the X axis, Y axis is the number of donors per project for the black people in the, uh, in the red and the other people in the, uh, in the blue. And X axis is the calendar time where I put the zero days, uh, where I put the death of George Floyd at the zero. So you can, what I can see is uh, uh, black people and other people they start to they they start they receive a very similar amount of uh, number of donors per project per day, and around three percent or five percent uh, people donate to each project, but they, they start to diverge exactly after the death of George Floyd, and this whole divergence start to go to the peak, very high peak, seven days after. Uh, the death of George Floyd, which is, is uh, June 1st, uh, June 2nd, and June, uh, June 1st. And also there's another peak at uh, June 19th. But I, I, I will actually want to focus mainly on the first peak. So you can see from this picture, there is a huge impact. So there's a day-to-day -day responsive to the Black Lives Matter movement. As here, I'm showing you another picture demonstrating, demonstrating how, does the, how does the number of protests move over time. And you can see there is a peak at the June 1st, and there's another peak at the June 19th. So the conclusion here I want to show you is people's donation behavior, a day-to-day -day responsive to Black Lives Matters, and that's our essential identification strategy. So what's more? So we also are trying to understand the, the channels. So how people know all these things. So we, we collect the Google search uh, data, uh, which is a measure of the public uh, internet in, uh, attention. We found that uh, the Google search intensity regarding Black Lives Matter goes its peak at the June 1st and 2nd. So, uh, well, we also do it, what we also do uh, it, we can do is we can track from the for the for the traditional social media. How does this uh, reports on the Black Lives Matters look like over time? And what we find is this picture. It goes to the peak around the June 19th. So what we conclude from the whole thing is that people's donating behavior are day-to-day -day responsive to the way social media is going to report this event from for both internet and the traditional uh, newspaper. So in order to show you the significance of our results, I'm going to do a regression discontinuity exercise by uh, thinking about what, what happened around the neighborhood before and after of the Black Lives Matters. So I'm running this regression. Y axis is the number of donors per day for the Project J. And uh, we have the black people indicator uh, interacting with uh, the weather, the time period of the donation happens after the death of George Floyd. So this gamma one zero is going to return as the, 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 the things we want to look at. So we have the varying bandwidth to play around our nice features. So here is our result, the gamma hat. So we find the effect of a donation is very, the effect of BRM is very large and significant and especially large when we have very short bandwidth and it's consistent with the picture I showed you before. In the short run, it has a huge impact on systemic change in the people's donation be behavior. And uh, uh, when we have time, goes, uh, bandwidth goes up, the effect is smaller because we are making the thing average out. But so now let's think about uh, the, another question. Are the COVID shutdown policy, reopen policy responsive? So, so through this, uh, so the conclusion here first is not likely. So, uh, uh, so shutdown happens around March, reopen happens around the middle of May. It's hard to say. It's really hard to distinguish from Black Lives Matters, and different for different states. What I mean here, the timing of the shutdown reopen is different, different for different states. So I'm going to show you not likely. So here in this graph, I'm showing you the similar estimate before, but I'm putting the center time from the death of George Floyd to the timing for each state. Uh, where the shutdown policy start to in action and reopen policy start to in action. And here is our estimate. In the left hand side is the shutdown policy. As you can see, with a very short bandwidth, seven days to 36 days, three days, the effect is almost zero. So, 
And we will have an even larger bandwidth that in fact is to be larger and larger, and those to be significant going forward. And these 33 days, uh, which the effect goes to be very significant, is exactly the timing at which the Black Lives Matter starts to kick into this uh, sample. So if we don't have fine level data, we'll be mistakenly saw the effect of, uh, there is the effect of uh, staying home order, this one, but actually it's not, it's because of the Black Lives Matters. And what's more on the right hand side, the thing is particular, uh, a big problem for the identification. As you can see, if you have, you don't have data finer than a weak level, you will start to get very significant effect to the staying home order, but you know, it's not, the staying home order effect. So the general exercise here, uh, the general takeaway here is that if we don't have high frequent data, more precise when the uh, weekly level, while the previous literatures uh, on the Black Lives Matters, they all use the monthly level or at most weekly level data, we are not able to argue against the other confounders, not just uh, reopen policies, but many other, many other things. So, also, for our curiosity, uh, are the COVID cases responsive? Um, and the answer is no. So what I'm going to provide you here in this uh, for today's talk is we plot this black and white ratio of the COVID cases, and we don't find a sudden change before and after the Black Lives Matter. And especially, if anything, the, this ratio goes down over time. So uh, we could do more exercise, for example, or we can have a treatment intensity analysis uh, in the first place. So what we find is a zip code with more pronounced protest experience, a larger reduction in the fundraising gap, zip code with a larger degree of the prejudice measure from using the implicit attitude test against American people, um, African-American people tends to experience a larger effect. And uh, zip code with a larger inequality in the uh, fundraising gap uh, experience a larger effect. So all this shows you that it uh, seems like the supply of the, of the protest is well, well matches its demand and it's going to be more pronounced for the places that have a larger inequality. And second, our identification is also robust to the date, uh, state, zip, uh, zip code fix effect, as you, uh, and we can add project characteristic variable interacting with the uh, time dummy as a control and doesn't change our estimates at all. So more particularly, I want to highlight that uh, if we add the, add the, the project fix effect itself, we're not going to have to change, uh, have changing our effect. So this is in is in the same spirit as our last exercise, which is to focus on the a project that have experienced the, the Black Lives Matters. And by looking at the same project and look at their donation right before and right after the Black Lives Matters, we still find very significant effect. So uh, due to time limitation, let me uh, quickly skip over the question two. Uh, in the second part, we want to argue that this reduction in the fundraising gap reflects the changes in the emphasis bias. So how is that? So the basic uh, argument is that our setup is very similar to the audit study in which you randomly send CV to the people, to the labor market and change the information on the CV, uh, CV's information. And our, uh, so therefore, our racial gap here measures the emphasis bias. So furthermore, I have more arguments. So first of all, if you think about stranger donors, so here we have the online platform, right? If you are stranger donors, you don't have any private information for the uh, beneficiary. So you make the info decision based on information just from the website. As same as our econometricians, therefore controlling for this information will be able to generate quasi experimental comparison. So second, you might be wondering, can the donors be part of the social uh, networks? And of course they can be, and it turns out 50% of the donors are your friends or your relatives. But I want to argue that they are not the compliers who respond to the Black Lives Matter protest. So the uh, argument, 
comes from the uh, empirical observation that in terms of the heterogeneous causal effect, the, the characteristics of local network doesn't matter. For example, the income and especially black people fraction, uh, internet accessibility, and more importantly, the, demo, uh, the Democrat and Republic ratio of that county. So lastly, we also, since we have the name information, we do this exercise showing you uh, answering who donates more. And we find that uh, in the long run, especially white people are the majority source of donation to contributing to this reduction in the gap. So that's a very important implication since it denotes that the United States society becomes more integrated instead of more separate, segregated. So uh, in terms of the long run, third part uh, is still in progress, but it's close to finish. And at least I can guarantee you that within a year after the uh, Black Lives Matters, there's an effect and very persistent, but much smaller than the long run effect, and then the short run effect, sorry. So let me wrap up. Uh, does the racial just movement change racial prejudice? Uh, yes, our answer here, uh, for the Black Lives Matters, they chan did change the structure of racism by, held by the white people. And I want to still show the caveats uh, to conclude my presentation today. So first, we only show the benefits of the Black Lives Matters. The, there is still a lot of cause uh, related to that. For example, there's a violence, there's a riots. Uh, so, and second, there is still a long way for the policymakers to mitigate the systemic taste discriminations by designing a proper policies. So that's the end of my presentation. I think it's just right on time. So uh, thank you very much. Here's my information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was indeed a very nice presentation of an interesting paper. Uh, and also good in time. We are a little bit late in total, but that's not because of you. Um, so, uh, do we have questions? Uh, yes, I have questions for Kashin. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, so you Kashin, are you? I oh, should yes, say in general. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Just a second. I should say in general for the audience. Uh, I haven't said that before. I thought everybody knows that if you have a question, you can also write into okay. uh, the the chat, but not not you now. But you can also raise your hands or just talk. Uh, but in case you you during the talk you have an idea to ask a question, please type it in. Yes, but okay, okay, okay. go ahead yes. now. Okay, sure. Uh, so uh, this is a good analysis, but I have a few questions is about the mechanism behind the results. So you agree it is because the sympathy, right? Uh, after this uh, movement, but it mm -hmm. is possible that the mood, I mean, the mood of the people uh, which cause this kind of the, the increased donation or like the, the, the change of the donation. For example, like the people maybe feel very sad after this, 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 this news about Floyd. So, uh, oh, uh, so I'm not trying to mm -hmm. very uh, heavily distinguish all these terms. Uh, I decided mm -hmm. to choose for the empathy, just for understanding, but I treat what you said and my empathy as the same thing here. Okay. So it's, I, I, I just want to argue something uh, change to uh, the donors, the public's the preferences. Uh, so that's the thing I want to claim about how we label these preferences is not actually, I, I don't know how to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, the second uh, question is, okay, uh, sorry, excuse me. Okay, the, the internet is not good. Okay, the second question is about the, you, you find that the white people donate more, right? So yes. It is possible that maybe they are, they are rich or richer or, or something, so they donate more. Uh, definitely less, less, less very likely. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's very likely. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would still say I'm not trying to come uh, competing. Right. I'm j but I, I just want mm -hmm. to say that there's a big, in absolute of a number, there's a big bunch of, uh, donation comes from white. I mean, okay. it doesn't matter if they are poor or rich. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as they help the black people, it's a good thing. And also, mm -hmm. I don't see any changes in the volume of a donation. So it is the margin of 
donating or not, that's that matters here. So they're the okay. Mm -hmm. So you cannot control the individual fixed effect for the uh, for the, the the people, right? I mean, the individual fixed effect. You can check the the record uh, they donate on the website. Can you check check the don donation record? I mean, the individual fixed effect. Okay. Is there... It looks like a uh, is, uh, is, is, is is <laughs> okay. At the okay. moment, she is not. So, okay. okay. So I, I think I think I think we okay. we are short in time anyway. So uh, if mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is not another urgent question. I don't see that at the moment. Let us uh, move on. Thank you very much uh, to uh, the speaker and Shun um, Li who asked the question. Now we have uh, the second contributed uh, a paper, uh, which is by Odilia Eisler and um, Osnat Israeli, which are both here. So for what I underst have understood is uh, that Osnat is presenting. Is this is right. Okay, yes, perfect. Yes. Thank you very I'm much. Sorry, no, you, I lost you lost... Yeah, you lost the contact, but yeah, we, we had to move on, no problem. Uh, yes, go ahead. Now on. We, we have, yeah. Now let's let uh, Osnat uh, speak. Um, she will speak about does a tragic event affect different aspects of attitudes towards immigration? So please, Osnat. Okay, thank you. Um... I am Osnat Israeli from the Ashkelon Academy College in Israel. And this paper is uh, written with uh, Odelia Heisler, who is also participating in the conference. And it is called, Does a Tragic Event Affect Different Aspects of Attitudes Toward Immigration? Immigrants and refugees are at, are, are at the top of the public agenda. The map here shows major conflict areas around the world as of 2020. And the graph here shows that the number of refugees continued to rise in 2021 and is expected to rise even further in 2022 due to the ongoing war in Ukraine. Immigration has started to become a prominent issue in 2015 in what is known as the European migrant crisis, when there has been a dramatic increase in the number of uh, people trying to reach Europe, many of them risking their lives while trying to enter Europe by sea. The data here shows us that in the first nine months of 2015, about 3,000 people were reported dead or missing while trying to reach Europe. And the death toll continued to rise in 2021 when, when at least about 1,900 people have died or gone missing while trying to cross the Mediterranean from North Africa. One of those tragic events is the drowning of Alan Kurdi. On September 2nd, 2015, the three-year-old Alan Kurdi, along with his family and 12 other immigrants, boarded a small boat in Bodrum, Turkey, in an attempt to reach Greece. However, about five minutes after leaving Bodrum, their boat capsized, and Alan Kurdi, his mother, brother, and two other immigrants perished in the accident. The photograph of Alan Kurdi's body lying on the Turkish shore made worldwide headlines and became an iconic image. We do not show the photograph here because it is too heartbreaking, but uh, I believe that most of you know what photograph I'm uh, talking about. You can push the reaction button to raise your hand or write in the chat. Maybe I'll wait a second so you can look it up on Google. Anyway, we can see the um, impact of the photograph 
from this uh, graph here taken from Google Trends showing the number of searches of the term refugees around the world. The first peak here is at the beginning of September after the drowning of Ellen Kurdi. The next peak is in mid-November after the terror attacks in Paris, which are not in the scoop of our paper. So the photograph made headlines, but did it change different aspects of attitudes toward immigration? We consider four aspects of attitudes in our research. Opposition to immigrant submission, realistic and symbolic threat, criteria for immigrant submission, and social distance. The methodology we use is the natural experiment approach, which has become more familiar after this year's Nobel Prize laureates, David Carr, Joshua Angrist, and Guido Invence, who have shown that natural experiments can be used to answer central questions for society, for example, about uh, how minimum wages and immigration affect the labor market. A natural experiment is an empirical study in which individuals are exposed to the experimental or control conditions, and the assignment is determined by nature or by other factors outside the control of the investigator. Only a, a limited number of studies have analyzed the effect of major events using a natural experiment uh, framework because it is difficult to accurately measure attitudes exactly before and after unpredictable incidents. Uh, yet, there have been some uh, papers who address the impact of terror attacks on attitudes toward immigration. The 9-11 attacks, the terror attack in Bali in 2002, the Madrid bombing in 2004, and the terror attacks in Paris in 2015. In our case, the drowning of Alan Kurdi coincided with the interview period of the seventh round of the European Social Survey, survey in Portugal, allowing us to use it as a natural experiment and respondents who were interviewed after the drowning were the treatment group, and uh, respondents interviewed before served as the control group. We will now elaborate on the four aspects of attitudes. The first aspect is opposition to immigrants' admission, which is constructed of seven items, asking the extent to which respondents think that Portugal should allow people from other countries to come and live in Portugal. The seven questions refer to seven groups of immigrants, for example, immigrants of a different race or ethnic group from the majority. The answers range from allow many to allow none, so a higher value of the aspect means that the individual is more anti-immigration. Uh, we used factor analysis to determine that the items belong to the same Latin construct, and we tested reliability using Kronbach's alpha. Uh, additionally, in this in, in next two aspects, the answers to the questions were averaged and then standardized for comparison reasons. The second aspect is realistic and symbolic threat, uh, referring about uh, to the anticipation of negative consequences resulting from immigration. For example, regarding the economy, but also on crime, cultural life, or in general, whether immigration makes Portugal a better or worse place to live in. The third aspect is criteria for immigrants' admission, including four questions asking about the importance of different traits in deciding whether immigrants should come and live in, uh, in Portugal. For example, 
having good educational qualifications, but also being able to speak the country's official language, having work skills that the country needs, and being committed to the country's way of life. The last aspect is social distance, um, which includes two questions asking, how much would you mind if a close family member marries an immigrant of a different race or ethnic group, or if you have one as a boss? Um, these two questions are highly correlated and were used as a single factor in previous research. And as a third of the answers of both questions uh, was centered on would not mind at all, we recoded this variable into a binary variable with a value zero given to those who answered that they would not mind at all in both questions and a value of one otherwise. Coming back to the photograph, the image of Alan Kurdi evoked empathy and compassion that neuroscience and psychological research associate with the motivation to help. Empathy is the capacity to share the feelings of others. Compassion is a social emotion elicited by witnessing the suffering of others and is associated with feelings of concern and warmth and the literature shows that it is linked to the motivation to help and to pro-social behavior. Thus, we theorize that not all four aspects would be affected similarly by the photograph, and that the first aspect, the willingness to allow more immigrants into the country, and the last aspect, social distance, who are more closely linked to pro-social behavior they would be more affected. Uh, two previous uh, papers have already addressed the effect of Alan Kurdi's uh, drowning on attitudes, but on a single question or a single aspect of attitudes. The first by Solberg and others performed a survey experiment in which shortly after the publication of Kurdi's photograph, they drew a sample of respondents, some of whom were shown the photograph, while the others were used as the control group. Both groups were then asked whether fewer refugees should be accepted in Sweden. And the procedure was performed again in October. And they found that in September, the image evoked support for a more liberal refugees acceptance policy. However, in October, people viewed the photograph through their left-right ideological orientation. The second paper is also a paper written by Odelia and myself, in which we compared the effect of uh, Alan Kurdi's drowning to the effect of the drownings of more than 1,000 immigrants in April of the same year. We theorized, following the identifiable victim theory, that the death of a single identified child would have a greater effect on attitudes than the death of more than 1,000 statistical victims. Um, the aspect of attitudes we considered in that paper is actually the first aspect in the current paper, opposition to immigrants' admission. So I'm spoiling some of the suspense here when I'm telling you in advance that opposition to immigrants' admission reduced significantly after the drowning of Alan Kurdi, but no such effect was found after the drownings in April. Other qualitative research showed a dramatic change in media narratives and an increased donation behavior after the uh, event. So after constructing the four aspects of attitudes, 
we ran four regressions, one for each aspect. The first three aspects were estimated using OLS, and the last aspect, social distance, was uh, estimated using a logit regression. X is a vector of sociodemographic and economic controls, such as uh, age, gender, religion, education, economic status, etc. And T is our main variable of interest. It is the treatment variable, receiving a value of one if the individual was interviewed after the incident belonging to the treatment group, and zero if the individual was interviewed before the incident and belonging to the control group. The control group included about 230 respondents who were interviewed from June 10th throughout July and August. And the treatment group included respondents who were interviewed after September 3rd till October 5th, including about 250 observations. We performed a balancing test um, with regard to observable and regional characteristics in order to rule out selection bias due because of the differences between the two groups. Um, and we found no statistically significant differences in the key variables affecting attitudes. And now to the results. Opposition to immigrant submission significantly decreased after the event. This aspect refers to the willingness to allow more immigrants into the country and may relate to a greater motivation to help. The size of the effect was quite substantial and equivalent to the effect of about seven years of education. A smaller and statistically insignificant effect was found regarding the perception of immigrants as a threat and on criteria for immigrant submission. The drowning also significantly reduced the reluctance to associate with immigrants through marriage or, a, or as a boss. We can see the results here. The first row is the treatment variable. It is significant at the 95 percentage level and negative in the first and last aspects, reducing opposition to immigrant admission and reducing social distance. As to the control variables, they were mostly as expected. We did not find evidence that age affects uh, attitudes, and the uh, gender mostly uh, was mostly insignificant also. As expected, education significantly reduces anti-immigration attitudes in all four aspects, and being an immigrant uh, mostly also reduces anti-immigration uh, sentiments. On the other hand, being a Roman Catholic usually increases anti-immigration sentiments. The two last uh, variables are subjective economic variables. The original question was uh, how the respondent feels about his household income. And we can see that a respondent who feels that it is very difficult to live on present income have ha has, has higher anti-immigration attitudes compared to the omitted category, which was respondents who felt they are coping or living comfortably on present income. Uh, this makes sense as uh, immigrants usually compete with the uh, low skilled and thus low, way, uh, low income workers. We performed the three robustness checks to strengthen our results. First, we shortened the time interval of both the control and treatment groups. 
and we got similar results. Uh, second, we used a placebo question. We checked whether the drowning had an effect on, on a moral question that uh, should not in principle be affected by the drowning. Uh, the question was whether gays and lesbians should be free to live their own lives as they wished. And we did not find uh, a significant effect of the drowning on this uh, question. The last robustness check was a placebo event simulation. We used a random date as a fictitious event. And uh, we tested whether this fictitious event had an impact on the four aspects of attitudes. And we found that the, uh, the treatment effect was not significant in all four aspects of attitudes. And conclusions. The results suggest that tragic events that evoke empathy and compassion for the victim influence attitudes regarding helping behavior toward immigrants and probably increase identification with the victim, thereby ameliorating social distance. However, empathy did not seem to affect aspects that are less related to emotions and poor social behavior and presumably involve more cognitive thinking. In other words, we may say that the respondents st still felt that uh, immigration is uh, bad for the country, but because they felt compassion, they were uh, willing to allow more immigrants into the country. A possible implementation could be for the Russia-Ukraine war. If the main target is to raise donations for the refugees, then an article presenting an identified victim with a photograph and details should probably help, but its effect on an established opinion regarding the war. For example, is the war justified? Should the European Union be more involved uh, this effect is more doubtful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osnat. Uh, now, do we have questions? I mean, if I may start, um, uh, of course, it is very important to understand how these singly events affect uh, uh, opinions and and also maybe short term behavior, but short term. The question is, we have seen um, uh, dramatic situations, always dramatic situations all around the world, and um, what people uh, do, they react at short term. Yes, uh, but uh, half a year later, it's all gone. Yes, uh, think about the 2015 wave of migrants, refugees to Germany, for instance. Yes, uh, there were at the, at the first half of the year, uh, uh, Germans were waiting at the stations to, to welcome refugees and, uh, and, and were uh, 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 distributing teddy bears and whatever. And half a year later, uh, the, 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 the feelings were completely different. So uh, the issue is, what are the very likely long run effects? Of course, in the short term, and that's similar to the previous talk. Yes, I mean, the two talks uh, are related in this sense. It, it, it's, it's helpful, and that's what's also your point, to, cre to create maybe support, uh, 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 funding, and, and so on. But the question is, how long uh, and, and, and how effective this really is changing the um, the general uh, 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 attempts to, to welcome uh, migrants and to deal with migrants. The, the situation is not solving, unfortunately. So are you more optimistic? I mean, how, do, how can we measure and maybe also compare? I mean, how, how does this event compare with other single uh, kind of uh, events in terms of strength so that we can a little bit get a yardstick um, uh, between, between situations? Um, we 
checked how long the effect uh, uh, holds in our previous paper, and we saw that it did not uh, have a long-term uh, effect. But what, yes, uh, unfortunately. Um, what we see here that even in the short term, not all aspects are uh, impacted by the event. Only uh, aspects uh, which are linked to pro-social behavior, that, like the donations you uh, mentioned. So uh, actually it's not very um, encouraging um, conclusion that it is short uh, term and also limited to certain types of uh, aspects and behavior. Yes, yes. okay. Now, um, are, there, are there further questions? Um, I don't see that at the moment. So thank you very much for a very interesting and uh, important uh, paper which documents the situation. Let's now move on to the next uh, uh, speaker uh, where uh, we will hear about cultural uh, breakers and policy implementation. Uh, how did China promote uh, later marriage in the 1970s? And uh, the presenter is Wai Chen from Shanghai Tech uh, University. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you Hi. hear me? Hi. Very well. Uh, okay, so I'll start. Uh, so the previous two, the previous two talks uh, talks about uh, a two specific event. How how does two specific event uh, affect uh, the culture? So my talk will also follow this line. So my title would be cultural break and policy implementations. So here is my motivation. So the motivation is related to China's family planning. So in many cases, traditional culture is actually an obstacle to policy implementation. Uh, take China's family planning, for example. Uh, in the 1970s, the government wants to reduce fertility, but the traditional culture is to have many children. So there's a conflict between uh, government's policy and the culture. Now in 2000 and 2022, the situation somehow gets reversed. Now the government wants the Chinese people to have more children, which is the culture already become, become a new norm to have few children. So again, in this case, the culture become an obstacle to the policy implementation. So the question is, what if someone could break this type of culture? So my first question here is, can the presence of culture breakers facilitate policy implementations? So I will study a very specific scenario. So the scenario would be China's experience in promoting late marriage in the 1970s. So here we are focusing on the timing of marriage. Now the policy would be uh, in the 1970s. So I, I bet everyone knows the policy, one child policy. But actually before the one child policy, there's, it takes a form said a later longer fuel. So the policy also regulated the, the timing of marriage. So during this time, the government wants people to get married later. But the culture is, uh, especially in rural areas, people wish to get married early. So interestingly, during this period, there's a very special type of people, which is called the send-down youth. I will introduce more details about this group of people. So in short, this group of people, which is about 16 million, they were originally in urban areas, but somehow they were mandated to resettle in rural areas. So therefore, they were somehow, they were outsiders to the rural villages. During the same period, actually, the government wished that those Santa youths could be the role models for the later longer fewer. So if you would look at this graph, you will see the three events, the policy, which is later longer fewer, and the cultural breakers, which is the Santa youth, and the later marriage, they occurred all around the 1970s. So here you can see uh, China's average age of first marriage started initiated a very rapid increase 
during the early 1970s. It happens at the same time period during the Cultural Revolutions. And here is the little longer figure and the same down movement. Uh, due to time limitations, I will skip the literature and I will spend more time on the background because uh, I bet uh, not everyone is familiar with this, this piece of history of China. So I will introduce the two policies and how they interact with each other. So the first policy is a later longer figure. So the earlier version, this is the earlier version of China's family planning, and it started in can be in 1970. So every every province established a group of people called a family planning leading group, which can be viewed as a high order leaders, which is guiding the policy implementations. So the late longer view it has three words. So in this paper, I will focus on later. Later is, is later marriage, which uh, encourage women to get married uh, no earlier than 23 and the men no earlier than 25. So uh, there are some details, but I will skip this. So uh, in short, uh, they like a fewer. They were not as restricted as the went the policy, but there is still some uh, stringent uh, elements in this policy. Uh, for this, this uh, graph shows the, uh, the gradual implementations of the later longer field policy. Uh, regarding the Sinta movement, so we are mainly focused uh, the, during the period of the Cultural Revolutions uh, when about 16 million people uh, urban youth, for some political reasons, they were somehow they were relocated to the rural villages. And after the end of the movement, uh, most of them returned to urban areas. So, uh, this, is, so this graph shows about uh, how many of urban youth went down to the rural villages every year. And uh, this graph shows uh, where, the, where did they go. So the darker areas shows those counties received the most than our use. So how does these two events interact with each other? So I would like to, to show, uh, argue three status facts. So the first fact is the government, they encourage the Sina youth themselves to get married late. And here I will show you three reports from People's Daily, which is Remy uh, Rebao, the leading article of the government. So here uh, I translated the original version of the People's Daily, and this, this would be the English, and this would be the Chinese. So the key word is, so here you can see, uh, they were the for the chairman's mouth of proletarian policies, and they explicitly said, we should encourage later marriage for those Zenda youth and help them arrange their lives. And this is uh, this article. This article is actually a letter, a letter written by the Zenda youth to the People's Daily. So, so therefore, the Senna youth, they claim, they said they resist the influence of early marriage culture. And actually, this sentence means during that time period, the rural culture is to get married early, right? So this is why this, those Senna youth, they need to resist the influence. Also, they call that themselves, the Senna youth should lead in the changing the custom of the late marriage. There would be many different type of articles, and I will not uh, translate all of them. Meanwhile, there, there were also some practical reasons for the Senate youth to get married late. And the reason it actually is quite intuitive because they were not voluntary, right? Because they, because they, they were mandatory resettled in the rural villages. And many of them, they don't, don't regard rural villages as their homes. So they don't want to get married there. Also, many of them were afraid that if they get married and they have children there, this would hinder their probability of returning to their urban homes. And uh, also, if we look at the data, you can see here the dark areas is the distributions of marriage for the uh, uh, lo rural locals. 
and the and the other bar would be uh, the distributions for the center use. So here we can see uh, the center use they were much likely to get married late. And here, this is the threshold for the send down for the late marriage. And here we can see uh, send down women. They were much more likely to be obliged to this late marriage policy. And there's also some anecdotal evidence to show this outside they actually can have some influence on the local culture. Uh, this is not surprising because in the 1960s and the 1970s, China were very poor. There were no, of course, there were no internet. There were no tele, There were very few television and the radios. So outsiders become a very become a very important source of the outside information. And those, and in China back then, uh, urban areas they were much more developed than rural villages. So people from the urban areas were a very important source of new information. So here you can see some interesting evidence. So in this paper for Bonin, you can see the center use they brought many new customs to the rural village, like uh, uh, teeth brushing, uh, cigarettes, uh, soccer drinks, including Coca-Cola. And they also helped to fight some uh, Bad traditional culture, uh, like uh, like koto. So the the wives needed to koto uh, in front of their husbands when getting married. And uh, the last piece of evidence is that government explicitly wished the senior youth to to serve as a role model in promoting later marriage. Uh, this is this this is best reflected in drawing lines. A Prima Jonas instruction in 1974. So he highlights this, this, his instruction in red. The so family planning should not be separated from the thinner use, and the urban use should be the role models when they went down to the countryside. So here you can see uh, John Lai, uh, he wished that he, uh, wished that he realized that an, an obstacle to family planning is those traditional rural cultures such as to have more children and uh, to have more sons. So therefore, uh, my research actually wanted to estimate whether the presence of those standard youths, who are the cultural breakers in my framework, could facilitate the implementation of the late marriage policy. Uh, the empirical strategy is quite standard. It would be the cohort uh, difference in difference. So here I have two variations. So the first variation is the before after. So this means uh, during, right before the age of marriage, whether, uh, whether the later longer field policy is implemented in this province. And the second variation would be the density of the senior youth in this country. So this is a standard cohort difference in different strategy, and uh, I control a wide range of uh, control variables. So I will skip this discussion. Uh, the data is standard, so I think many of you are very familiar, including the census and the uh, China Family Panel Study, which includes some attitudes questions. I will skip this. And uh, this is the most important evidence for this paper. So here I break this before after term to uh, a long list of cohort variables of cohort dummies. So here you can see uh, at the time when the late uh, the, the late longer field policy is implemented, if the people they were old enough, here you can see the, they were not related to the density of senior youth because for the rural people. Most of them would already get married by the age of 25. So if they were younger than a certain age, so you'll see now the more the center youth there, then the later they will get married. Here, and this effect is mainly happens for women, and the men is barely affected. So if you believe me in this graph, then all the following graph would be the uh, parametric translations of this graph. So if we translate right to a, a before after term, 
then it is not surprising that here we can see a strong effect for the woman, but a, a much smaller effect for the men. I'm not going to uh, spend uh, uh, too much time on this. Uh, I think there is, a, there is a wide range of robust check. Uh, let me see. Uh, I, I will skip this for this time. So if you have any questions, I can go back to the discussions. So I spend more time on discussions in Macdon. So why does this those scenarios could facilitate the policy implementations. So here I will highlight two mechanisms. So the first mechanism would be the attitude towards gender roles. Uh, in the CFPS data, there were a set of questions asking people about their uh, gender roles and their family norms, first, uh, such as whether the respondents agree that men should focus on career while women should fo focus on family. And there were questions about family norms, such as whether children should fulfill their parents' dream instead of their own. And if we look at this graph, if we run into the similar regressions by replacing the dependent variable with those uh, attitudes variables. So here we can see uh, for those more exposed women, they were less likely to agree with traditional family generals. So, there is, so this is suggestive evidence that says uh, those who were more exposed to the Sina use, they were not less likely to agree with this traditional family, uh, tra traditional family, uh, traditional gender roles, and that they were also more likely to get married late. And the second is, uh, mechanism is that it facilitates a propaganda program. So in order to promote the later longer field policy, uh, the government also heavily initiated the type of broadcasting program or the propaganda program. This, so if we look at the, we use search the key words in the people's data. So here you can see uh, in the 1974 and 1975, the words like uh, gender equality, uh, half the sky, half, half the sky is a special term in China that encouraging gender equality. And this is uh, first uh, proposed by Chairman Mao. And you can also see uh, the term family planning and later marriage. So here you can see by this, so I create a time series of variations in the uh, intensity of propaganda program. So if I interact with this intensity, with the media exposure of the individual. And here you can see some very interesting pattern. For example, so if the so if you are if the keywords were only about the family planning related to your marriage, so here you can see only the exposure um, in the uh, that around the marriage agents uh, like uh, 18 to 22, it will have some effect. But if you were too early say 13 to 17, then we don't observe such effect. But if the key terms are about gender equal, equality, so even early exposure are like 13 to 17, they also have some effect. So, so to, to conclude, uh, my study uh, uh, studied the interactions between a policy and the cultural breakers who can potentially uh, break the traditional local norms. And, uh, and, the, and the, my main finding is uh, cultural breakers can be a catalyst for policy implementations by breaking traditional norms. Uh, sorry, maybe I'm going too fast. Uh, so if, there, if I miss any details, then you can ask me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, to be so much uh, Valentine. This um, brings us back into the schedule very well. <clears throat> well, um, are there questions from the audience to the paper? Again, the major issue, in my view, is, uh, is, is I mean, with all these cultural changes, what, what are the long-term implications? Of, uh, of, of culture, has this changed behavior in the long term? Uh, so thank you. 
uh, I think I have some evidence you here for for the for the long term. So so here you can see uh, the the effect for the peaks at around age sixteen, but even for who were just born, then we we also observe some effect even when they were just born. So uh, I do observe some long term effects. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? I see. Uh, so e maybe I can ask one yeah. question. So presumably, uh, the government must have done a lot uh, to promote the uh, family planning policy, and uh, the uh, using Sendan use as an example. Uh, could be one of them. So do you have an idea of the rel uh, relative importance of this uh, policy compared to others? Uh, like in terms of explaining the, uh, you know, the change in marriage and fertility behavior, what is the uh, relative importance in terms of magnitude of the Sendan use as an you know, example? Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Shreja. So uh, actually, this is exactly uh, one part which I am currently still working. This is about uh, how I should interpret this coefficient. So, uh, because my current finding is uh, says uh, so, the center use they could uh, improve the policy implementations. So, uh, this coefficient itself, it actually is not very interpretable. So, uh, so what I need to do is first, I need to have an estimate of the raw effect of the uh, late longer fever. Then we can say, for example, uh, then I need to have an estimate like uh, what, what happened if one county received, say, one standard deviation more than I use that it could uh, probably uh, increase the policy effectiveness by a certain percentage. Uh, this I'm currently uh, trying to estimate in this number to make those number more transparent. Okay. <clears throat> okay, more questions, remarks? Well, then uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, certainly a very interesting piece uh, uh, and uh, documentation of a very important uh, historical part of, 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 of the history of China. Uh, now uh, we have uh, uh, go to the last speaker. It's uh, Yu Sang from Sun Yat-sen University. And uh, the title of the paper is the longest of the morning, uh, morning in Germany. Do good, uh, do good deeds really earn uh, chits, uh, evidence from targeted poverty, elevation information, disclosure and stock price crash risk. So the, um, the recommendation of an editor, think about a shorter, shorter title of when you submit to a journal uh, would, would be my, uh, my, my, my personal feeling, so to speak. Uh, no critique. Uh, it's certainly very interesting. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Yu Zhang, and I'm from International School of Business and Finance, Sun Yat-sen University. Today, I'm going to talk about my paper, Do Good Days Really and Chase Evidence from Target Poverty Alleviation, Information Disclosure, and Stock Price Crash Risk. And as we know, sustainable investment, which incorporates environmental, social, and government factors into portfolio selection decision, has experienced unprecedented development in the last decade. Investors are increasingly applying these non-financial factors into their analysis to identify material risk and growth opportunity of a firm. Although ESG funds generally outperform the global market averages, potential risks, for example, reputational risks, uh, regulatory risks, and financial risks related to ESG investing are still present in a variety of contexts. Despite mounting evidence shows the influence of ESG practice on several market participants, 
there are limits insight regarding whether shareholders benefit from specific ESG efforts of firms. And stock price crash is dreadful for market participants as it lead to ban firm bankruptcy and sweep away billions of shareholder wealth, thus exploring Thus, exploring stock price crash determinants is important for protecting shareholder wealth and reducing agency problem. Prior research has found significant association between corporate social responsibility information disclosure and stock price crash risk. However, they have no consensus on whether CSR information disclosure mitigates or increases crash risk. Stakeholder theories argue that socially responsible firms tend to improve financial transparency with less bad news concealing behavior, which reduce crash risk. Other studies, however, taking an agency cost perspective, predict that CSR information helps managers to cover up bad news, which lead to higher crash risk. And while a growing number of firms have undertaken innovative CSR activities to promote social welfare due to ESG investment, the nexus between ESG efforts and future financial risk is still inconclusive. Based on this motivation, we investigate the effect of CSR information disclosure on future crash risk in the context of poverty alleviation, and it's an emerging ESG practice for firms that promotes social equity and sustainable development in China. China has provided an ideal setting to investigate our main research question for, for several reasons. And it's a and it's a quasi-natural experimental research setting that allows us to investigate the impact of firms engagement in poverty alleviation and well adjust potential endogeneity concerns. China and also China are characters by fast growth, but with opaque information environmental and inadequate regulatory we can further investigate important practical implications for emerging financial markets. And to test the impact of TPA information disclosure on stock price crash risk, we construct a stack difference in difference model. Given that plenty of firms implement TPA programs at different times, the stack difference and differences estimates may include comparisons between firms that participate in TPA later with ones that involves in TPA earlier, which may yield bias estimates. We decompose the stack DID estimates and yield a weight average of the estimates that are only influenced by comparison between the never treated control group and the treated groups. And our main conclusion is that firms participate in TPA activities suffer a significant subsequent increase in stock price crash risk. The positive association is more pronounced when a firm reduces poverty through industry development, employment, and public welfare. Firms using TPA-related terms more frequently in their annual reports or CSR reports are more prone to crash risk. When the firm lacks financial reporting transparency, managers have more incentives and abilities to utilize CSR activities to conceal negative information. External government and external governments mechanism, the positive relation between TBA information disclosure and crash risk, it's eliminately remarkable remarkably 
when there is increased monitoring by auditors, insurance companies, and foreign institutional shareholders. And here it comes to our contribution. First, our study contributes to nascent literature on TPA by investigating firms' engagement in poverty alleviation and shifting the focus from personal incentives in driving TPA engagement to economic consequence. Second, we end to the ongo ongoing literature on stock price crash risks. Our empirical findings also suggest that TPA engagement may be a tactic that is used by managers to hide non-value maximizing behaviors. Third, this paper provides new insight into business ethic issues in the context of TPA. We respond to recent call to in business ethic research, which has emphasized the context of actions when evaluating whether a specific act is ethically problematic. So here we come to our institutional background. <clears throat> Among the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations for the period through until 2030, and poverty in all forms everywhere is the first on the list. To eradicate poverty completely in rural areas, the Chinese government has recently initiated a nationwide campaign to alleviate poverty. To encourage more firms to participate in TPA campaign, SSE and SZSE have mandated TPA information disclosures for these firms since 2016. <clears throat> TPA information disclosure facilitates transparent information flow in the sense that such all-round and systematic non-financial report can provide incremental information for share for stakeholders. However, there might be there might result agency problems, such as we had the example um, airline group HMA and real estate develop ever granted. In the past, both of them um, has claimed that they will donate uh, about one billion yuan to their. Um, to their hometown to uh, alleviate poverty, to alleviate poverty. However, um, in the following two years, they have um, they have uh, confirmed um, seriously financial problems. So we think I think so we think there may be an agency problems within the TBA campaign and the program's initiation. And here we comes to our literature review about the stock price crash risk. And stock and crash risk is defined is defined as the conditional schoolness of return distribution, which captures a symmetry in risk, especially the downside risk. And the main cause of it and, and is about Oh, one of the noticeable strands of literature based on agency theoretical point of view links managers' bad news holding behaviors to stock price crash risk, specifically exploring the, exploiting the information asymmetry between managers and investment. Managers are motivated to withhold bad news for um, reputation, compensation, and career concerns. When the bad news accumulates, um, when the bad news accumulates throughout the time, and it, it will reach a critical point, and the managers are no longer to be able to consume it, and all of the bad news will be released at the same time, and it causes these firms the stock price crash risk. And now. We come to the literature review about CSRs. Recently, practitioners and scholars had defined and measured CSR from the perspective of environmental, social, and government issues. Existing literature documents that CSR influence corporate performance, 
and other indicators involving litigation risks, financial constraints, and investment activities. One strand of literature suggests that CSR information disclosure lessen information asymmetry between managers and investors, thus mitigating stock price crash risk. Other study, however, stem from agency theory perspective and hold a negative view on managerial motivations for, for pursuing CSR. While the effect of CSI disclosure on stock price crash risk still remains inconclusive and controversial, TPA engagement is a new way for a firm to fulfill social responsibility provides us with a novel setting to study this important issue. And we, we raise a two competing hypotheses, and here it comes to the hypothesis development. Before the event of TPK activities, Chinese firms generally conduct, conduct CSR activities like philanthropy donation, eco-friendly products provision, and employees' welfare plans. The rise of TPA provides a new approach for a firm to undertake social responsibility, and it also signals managers' goodwill to improve social welfare and responds to great concern for others. Such kind of managers are less likely to get involved in opportunism and in, in, inclined to provide more transparent reports for stakeholders. Therefore, Systematic and comprehensive TPA information disclosure may lower information asymmetry between managers and investors. So we posit our H1, that is TPA information disclosure is negatively associated with stock price crash risk. But however, also hazard occurs when the CSR information disclosure has complicated ambiguous and non-comparable context. One of the most remarkable features of TPA is that participating firms are required to use target method, utilizing firms' strengths. After anal analyzing natural resource endowment of poverty-stricken areas, when firms carry out innovative approaches to develop unique poverty alleviation projects targeting paired areas. The disclosure of these projects display less programmability and comparability among peers. Moral hazards exist in TBA when the projects are so complicated and incomparable that stakeholders cannot detect and understand what managers are actually doing. So here we present our hypothesis two. TPA information disclosure is positively associated with stock price crash risk. So here it comes to our research designs. We man manually collect information on firms' poverty alleviation contribution from their annual reports or CSR reports. We obtain firms' financial data from the China stock market and accounting research and wind financial database. According to prior studies, we apply the following screening criteria to our sample. First, we exclude observation with um, assess liability ratio more than one or training weeks less than 30. Second, we exclude observation with missing data for constructing crash risk variables, TBA variables and control variables. Third, we exclude financial firms for our, from our sample because financial firms apply different accounting standards. Our final samples consist of um, one, um, cons yes, and consist the observation for the periods uh, 2012 to 2019. We use TPA dummy to measure whether a firm participate in TPA activities and disclose related information in their annual reports or CSR reports. The, dumb, the TPA dummy variable equals one if the firm participates in the TPA activities and zero otherwise. 
to test the impact of TPA information disclosure on stock price crash risk, we construct a staggered difference in difference model. And our other variable definition is, is present in, in, in these two tables. And the right column includes the independent variables such as TPA dummy and project, education, employee, incorporated and society. And, and these are the way of them to reach to help the uh, rural areas to alleviate poverty. And TPA information disclosure is measured by four variables such as annual number, CS number, annual war or CSR word. And it is the frequency of targeted poverty alleviation occurred in their annual reports or CSR reports. And this table presents the descriptive statistics for all the variable used in the regression analysis based on the samples of film years with non-missing control variables. Now this is it. and this is our empirical result and the coefficients on each project are significantly positive in all columns, which shows that the firms participate in TPA activities and disclose the related information suffer a significant increase in crash risk in the future. And the volatility of DID regression relies on meeting the parallel chain assumption, which requires similar pre-chains in stock price crash rate between treatment and control groups. The above two sets of results shows that there are no observable diversion chains in stock price crash risk between treatment and control groups before the, the exogenous shocks, suggesting that the parallel chains assumption is likely to hold in our setting. And this table reports the result from regression analysis of the relation between TPA information disclosure and future firm specific crash risk after controlling for other potential determinants of crash risk to mitigate concerns on omitted correlated variables. We end an array of variables that can potentially affect crash risk to base risk regression model, including market, competi market compi competition, one year ahead crash risk, corporate donations, and corporate social responsibility ratings that have been shown to influence crash risk to further, and to further mitigate the reverse causality concern and identify the cause impact of TPA information disclosure on crash risk of firms. We perform an instrumental variable regression using a botic in instrument. The botic instrument is based on weight average of national TPA participation growth weight with weights that depend on the average of the firms that participate in TPA programs in each pro in each industry. And also opacity is one of the factors that cause stock price crash since firms with low transparency are more likely to accumulate bad news. We postulate that financial reporting opacity affects the positive relationship between TPA disclosure and crash risk. And this table provides a test of our hypothesis. And to assess the robustness of our result, we carry out an array of sensitivity tests. We report the results of these tests in in these tables and these results are consistent with our baseline results. And here we come to our conclusions. 
CSR research has expanded from focusing on shareholder value maximizing to satisfying with more stakeholders and society at large, while reducing poverty has become a major challenge for many countries and international organizations across the world. The extend literature provides little evidence on firms' economic consequence of participating in poverty alleviation activities, despite the wide discussion of board CSI issues. Taking advantage of Chinese TPA activities, our results are among the first to show that firms participate in TPA activities suffer a significant subsequent increase in crash risk. Our findings show that emerging CSR activities aiming at uninfluenced stakeholders may bear hidden financial risk and managers can take advantage of customized and incomparable TPA projects to manipulate information strategically. This result is robust when we use different methods to alleviate endogeneity problems. And our findings discovered an, another potential strategy, strategy that can be used by managers to hide non-value maximizing behaviors. We think the ongoing crash risk literature, a line of studies explore the impact of corporate information disclosure, such as annual, such as annual reports, earning announcement, and philanthropy disclosures on the on the formation of stock price crash crashes. Distinct from these studies, we cast the role of TPA information disclosures, emerging CSR activities engaged by firms aimed at voyeurless stakeholders as potentially important app unexplored antecedent of crash risk. We demonstrate that minimum communication based on annual reports and CSR reports to be a likely biased way, making available only the positive results without reference to the actual cost paid by shareholders and personal benefits only achieved by managers. Through the complexity of TPA and ambiguous financial outcomes in it produced represent a more nuanced pictures of the interaction between managers and shareholders. Our studies also adds to business ethic issues in the context of TPA engagement by revealing a positive effect of the information disclosure of TPA on stock price crash risk. Our study demonstrates that CSR serving at unrelated stakeholder interest to enhance social welfare is not always beneficial in corporate governments. The existing corporate governments literature implies that CSR enhance positive relationship between firms and stakeholders so as to help firms with poor financial performance get out of trouble, reduce investors' irrational reaction to negative events, and protect firms from the threat from the threat of short selling and sharp decline in stock price. These studies focus on the benefits of CSR investment and overlook the business ethics problems behind the exchange of shareholder property for the, person, for the personal benefits of managers. TPA engagement is a double-edged sword that results in both positive and negative consequences to different groups. Firms utilizing corporate res res resources for social issues that are related to primary stakeholder may not create value for shareholder. Our finding of the instrumental value of TPA shed light on a new source of agency problem in the ethical outcomes of firms' TPA efforts, which has not traditionally been covered by firms' CSR initiatives. And this is um this is my um, okay this is all my words thank you for your listening thank you very much you for this interesting presentation and now again we have time for uh, questions can i get somebody from the audience
I don't think this was a contribution. I have also nothing in the chat. So, well, if uh, this is the case and everybody is satisfied, uh, we had a large audience uh, today. Hopefully, all of you will come back uh, tomorrow. You will recall that we have a different uh, time schedule tomorrow. We had to include Australia this morning. So, um, it's, it's, it's the time structure is different tomorrow. We start at uh, 7 p.m. Beijing uh, time, uh, in Germany 1 p.m., in London at, uh, at noon. Okay, do you want to, to, to say anything, or Gaia? I see somebody, okay. Yeah, I, I watch you here. Okay, fine. Uh, is, is nobody is, uh, is, is, is wishing to say anything, then we closed for today. I thank uh, the local organizers uh, for all their technical support and uh, let's, let's meet tomorrow. Thank you. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting.